speaker this afternoon is Professor Anna, Peter, uh, Anna Peterson from the Department of Religion at University of Florida, a position she's held since 2002. She has a bachelor's from the University of California at Berkeley and a master's and PhD at the, from the University of Chicago. She's, she's an affiliate member of the Center for Latin American Studies, the Tropical Conservation and, and Development Program, and the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. She was also a visiting fellow at Wesleyan University from 98 to 2000. Professor Peterson has published extensively with a particular focus on environmental and social ethics and the, re the relations between animal ethics and animal hypocrisy. Her latest book is <coughs> Being Animal, Based on Boundaries and Nature Ethics, published by Columbia University Press in 2013, following Everyday Ethics and Social Change in 2009, Seeds of the Kingdom, 2005, being Human, 2001, and Martyrdom and the Politics of Religion, 1997, now in its second print. She's also collaborated on a number of books and published dozens of articles and reviews in such diverse compendia as the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, the Socialist Review, and Environmental Journals. The scope of her thinking is suggested, I think, by some of her paper titles, which range from Oscar Romero and the Politics of Sainthood, to humans, nature, and the end of the world. She's carried out field research in Ohio, Kansas, Chile, Mexico, and Ecuador, somehow also, somehow also managing to fit in one year as academic director at the University of El Salvador. She's now working on two new projects, one on the place of practice and ethical theory, and the other on the ethics and politics of companion and the rest. The last point I'd like to highlight, where you could say shameless and plug, is her work as director of Plenty of People, a non-profit organization dedicated to rescuing and representing abandoned and neglected peoples. According to the website, the organization focuses on both dogs labeled peoples, a broad category susceptible to breed prejudice. Prejudice because despite popular conceptions, peoples can be, and often are, as friendly and affectionate as any other animal. Plenty of Pitbulls wants to upset this category, um, wants to upset this category, sorry, which is a gesture actually that runs like a motif through Professor Peterson's work. Indeed, her work is characterized by ceaseless questioning of categories, of the boundaries we draw around species and other things, whether pitbulls, humans, animals, or other. So, on that note, and without further ado, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Professor Honor Peterson to discuss the very complex question of euthanasia, human, and other. I'm hiring him. <laughs> okay, well, the, I, I, I did for this conference what I, I always do, and I tell myself each time I won't do it again, which is to start something completely new. Um, so unlike Donovan, who was bright enough to, um, you know, write something that was from something he'd already published and thought about for more than a couple of months, uh, I'm, I'm starting something new. Um, with this, and so I hope you'll bear with me um, a little bit. Um, I want to start uh, with, um, well, I was working on this paper uh, not that long ago. In my local newspaper, there was an editorial um, entitled Physician Assisted Suicide Needs Discussion. I thought, oh, this is very helpful. Um, and in that, there was a line where the writer said, why do we expect human love, he didn't say human, why do we expect loved ones to endure lingering, miserable deaths while we ensure that our pets die as free from pain as possible. So he made a comparison that is not uncommon. When, probably you've heard this, when people discuss decisions to euthanize pets, they often say things like, I just wish we could be so compassionate with people. And this is one of those throwaway lines that I think contains very significant ethical claims. Um, and in this case, the claims are that euthanasia is compassionate, <coughs> that it is the right thing to do with our pets, and that the laws regarding humans are cruelly restrictive. And there is a less obvious claim, and the one I want to explore here in particular, which is that it is possible and meaningful to think about euthanasia across the species line. Um, this comparison is not one that has received any or much serious scholarly attention. Um, there are conversations about human euthanasia and conversations about euthanizing uh, non-human animals, and they are fairly separate. They're trains that go along their own tracks. Um, 
And what I'd like to do here is see what happens when we hitch the trains together. Um, or more precisely, I want to ask what difference species makes in the moral evaluations and practical decisions we make about euthanasia. So um, my two trains, a marked human and other, seem to run parallel in certain circumstances, and that's what's mentioned in the op-ed piece I, meant, I uh, discussed. When there is a beloved individual, human or not, who is suffering from a painful, untreatable illness, um, this is the only kind of euthanasia that bioethicists discuss uh, in regards to humans. But when we turn to other animals, there's another kind of euthanasia, the killing of healthy but homeless dogs and cats in animal shelters. This is a train that can never carry humans, or rather it carries them only in the unthinkable circumstances of a final solution. And this terrible specter of genocide suggests that we enter a minefield when we dare to compare human and non-human life. But I think it's, um, it's worth entering and um, having conversation about it. So that's where I am going um, here. First, I'd like to talk about, and I'm sorry if this might be redundant for some of you, if there are any bioethicists in the audience. I'd like to just sort of define some terms and talk a little bit about um, some of the debates, hopefully quite briefly, about um, euthanasia and assisted suicide for humans. Um, first of all, uh, there's a very, very vast literature on, uh, on euthanasia and assisted suicide. It is by far the most commonly discussed um, issue in, um, in bioethics. And I'm not a bioethicist or, or in the sense of medical ethics, um, but um, I, I think I can give a sort of overview. Um, euthanasia is defined as a painless death caused by another for the good of the person who is dying. And those are three elements that are important. Um, it's caused by another, it is painless or as painless as possible, and it is for the good of the, um, of the person who will die. So the uh, AMA, American Medical Association, says euthanasia is the administration of a lethal agent by another person to a patient for the purpose of relieving the patient's intolerable and incurable suffering. And um, under this definition of euthanasia, I'm going to include uh, assisted suicide, um, for the purposes of this at least. Okay, and then um, when we talk about the ethics of euthanasia for humans, there are two important kinds of distinctions that, um, that, that ethicists discuss. The first one is the distinction between um, what is called passive and active euthanasia. Um, passive euthanasia is the withdrawal of life-sustaining life treatment or sustenance. Um, active euthanasia is um, actively killing, uh, usually by lethal injection. Um, this is a very, very important difference for all the discussions um, by bioethics, bioethicists. The general consensus, even though there are um, um, millions of possible positions here, um, but the general consensus is that passive euthanasia is morally acceptable because it's seen as letting nature take its course. Active euthanasia is much more controversial um, because it seems to be killing rather than letting die. And some people use those terms, killing versus letting die rather than active and passive. Um, and the AMA um, uh, Code of Ethics um, exemplifies this distinction. Code of Ethics for Physicians says that active euthanasia is, quote, fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer. It would be difficult or impossible to control and would pose serious societal risks. On the other hand, the AMA um, says that physicians uh, should permit passive euthanasia. They should, quote, respect the decision to forego life-sustaining treatment of a patient who possesses, possesses decision-making capacity. And this is a very common distinction also of, uh, among uh, ethicists and, and most religious uh, traditions also. Okay. Um, however, some philosophers um, you know, find that this distinction between active and passive is problematic. Uh, one, uh, Tom Beauchamp, argues that, uh, quote, rightness and wrongness depend exclusively on the justification for the action, not on the type of action it is. Active euthanasia may be justified, um, he thinks, uh, sometimes, in the case of a person who requests, an actively suffering, terminally ill person who requests a lethal injection, and there are times when passive euthanasia, um, say through failure to perform some treatment, is not immoral. Um, and more simply, um, some people argue that a slow death from starvation or dehydration is uh, less merciful than an overdose of morphine would be. So James Rachels, um, 
who writes a lot about these things, says that uh, once the initial decision not to prolong a person's agony has been made, active euthanasia is preferable to passive euthanasia. To say otherwise is to endorse the option that leads to more suffering, not less. So the decision that matters um, for him is that whether death is a good for the patient in the patient's own interest rather than the method, right? Um, so there's some challenge to this active passive distinction, but for the most part, that's a distinction that really, really matters with humans. The other distinction that matters is um, between voluntary, non-voluntary, and involuntary euthanasia. Um, and this is uh, focused on the question of consent. Voluntary euthanasia um, occurs when a person is clearly indicated a wish to die, either at the time or through an advance directive. Non-voluntary is when a person is unable to express an opinion and did not leave an advance directive, for example, someone who is in a, in a vegetative state. Involuntary euthanasia is when a person does not give consent and conceivably could. Um, and most of the time, this last is not euthanasia, since as Peter Singer points out, it's hard to see how killing a person who wants to go on living can be a good death. Um, so we combine all these different variables, and I, I won't belabor this, but I, it's important for some of the points I want to make in a minute. Um, we have voluntary active euthanasia, when someone, a physician actively kills someone who wants to be killed. Um, and this is um, illegal in the United States, uh, with a few exceptions, a um, few states, um, and uh, legal, obviously, in, uh, in the Netherlands and some other places um, in Europe. Uh, it's very controversial among ethicists, um, but not as much, um, not as much probably as it is with physicians and, uh, and the courts. Um, voluntary passive euthanasia is, is um, much less controversial. This is basically letting die. Someone has an advanced directive, does not want extraordinary treatment. Um, and this is supported by the AMA, by most um, hospitals, most religious groups, and most um, bioethicists. Um, Non-voluntary passive euthanasia um, is when someone requires um, someone is not in a position to give consent and requires extraordinary measures to stay alive. And this is a, a common um, and often very tragic situation. Um, and it's led to many legal battles when the family members disagree about whether or not a person would want to go on living. And I'm sure you've had court cases maybe um, here in the UK. We've had a number in the United States. Um, so that's the most sort of problematic legally. Um, and then the last category, involuntary uh, euthanasia. Again, you know, as Peter Singer says, this usually is um, murder um, when someone does not want to die, but someone else thinks that it would be better for them to die. Um, that's usually not euthanasia, but rather murder. And this is um, the slippery slope that many people who oppose euthanasia believe that we will get there, right? That we will, other people will decide whether or not it's in someone's interest to go on living. Um, and so this is a, a scenario that's often mentioned by, um, by ethicists who oppose um, euthanasia that will get to the involuntary state. Um, there is um, the occasional situation that, that some philosophers imagine. For example, the common one is uh, if soldiers cannot have a gravely wounded colleague who cannot move himself, um, and um, they cannot carry him, it may be kinder to kill him with a gunshot than to leave him to starve to death or to be tortured by the enemy. So that's the one scenario in which involuntary euthanasia sometimes is accepted by ethicists. And I'm emphasizing here what, what ethicists um, talk about um, because I'm interested in the moral arguments um, here. So um, speaking of the moral arguments, um, in favor of euthanasia and assisted suicide, the two themes are quality of life and individual autonomy. Um, the key question about quality of life is whether a life is worth living to, to that person. Um, and people who want to legalize euthanasia believe that there are things worse than death, including a lingering and painful process of dying. And they also emphasize autonomy, that, the, that people should be able to choose for themselves when their own lives are worth living. Um, against euthanasia, we have a, um, two main arguments. One is the, the slippery slope, the social risks of permitting physicians to kill their patients. And the other is the idea of um, the uh, unique value of human life. 
Um, on the slippery slope, the fear is that if people are permitted legally to choose death in some circumstances and if physicians are permitted to assist them, eventually we'll reach that scenario in which other people are deciding who should live and die. Uh, I don't know if, um, I know there's a lot of Americans here, uh, this is when we have the death panels, right, uh, that Obamacare was supposed to lead to. Um, so a uh, death panel is what's at the bottom of that slippery slope um, that the happy penguin is, is sliding to. Um, so the second point is the absolute value of human life, um, which is especially important for religious arguments about um, euthanasia. Um, most of the monotheistic traditions oppose active euthanasia on the grounds that God is the one who gives value to human life by creating it, and only God should decide when it ends. However, many um, religious groups um, do um, permit uh, passive euthanasia, letting die. They permit withdrawal of um, extraordinary, uh, they, you, they don't require extraordinary measures. However, the Catholic Church has fairly recently decided that um, food and hydration are not extraordinary. So um, you may not, uh, it, it's uh, Catholic hospitals and Catholic chaplains uh, cannot permit that. So what counts as extraordinary is um, sometimes uh, up, up for debate. Um, so anyway, the religious arguments often emphasize the absolute value of human life. The secular arguments um, tend to emphasize the, the slippery slope. Um, but what, what's interesting to me here and what begins to get us to the comparison across species is that on both sides, the pro and the con, we see an emphasis on the value of human life um, and a disagreement about what's the best way to respect it. Do we respect it by allowing people to choose for themselves when to die? Or do we respect it by saying only God decides? Um, and both, on both sides of this argument, we have an explicit or um, sometimes implicit claim that human life has unique, inviolable, and sacred um, value. And I think this value marks the momentous distinction between the deaths of humans and the deaths of all other creatures. So now I'm going to go to uh, euthanasia of other animals. Um, and when we turn to other animals, we have a um, definition by the American Veterinary Medical Association sounds very similar to the AMA. Um, it's ending the life of an individual animal in a way that minimizes or eliminates pain and distress. Note that the emphasis here is on the method of killing rather than the reasons, and uh, we'll get to that. Um, the um, question of intention does arise, um, and it's, um, it's important for the veterinary, um, veterinary code of ethics. Um, they say death should be a welcome event when continued existence is not an attractive option for the animal as perceived by the owner and veterinary. Right, so the intention, the idea that it, it would be in the good of the animal, could the animal tell you that, right? It's not an attractive option is the language that they use. Um, so there are echoes here of the debates and the, the code of ethics about human euthanasia, but I think there's some important differences. Um, first, consent, so the whole question of voluntary, involuntary, et cetera, is not um, relevant in the same way. Second, um, and the, the more important one, is that the lives of non-humans are contingent, um, and because of this, there are very different factors that create the discussion and um, shape the, um, the ethical conversation. About, um, about the two kinds of killings. Um, and in particular, um, there is another kind of killing um, for animals that would never be called um, killing for, for humans. Um, and um, that is, um, that is uh, the second kind I'll talk about. The first kind is, uh, is pet euthanasia, what I'm calling pet euthanasia. Um, the death of a companion animal who's suffering from an untreatable condition. And this is by far the most common cause of death for dogs and cats in the US who are living in homes, who are pets. Um, probably also, um, also here. Um, and this kind of euthanasia comes as the, at the end of a decision-making process that's very similar in some ways to the decision-making process about euthanasia for humans. Um, people ask, people who are making the decisions, or ethicists who might consider this, ask, can physical pain be controlled? Is there a chance of recovery? Is the quality of life such that good days outnumber the bad? And if the answers are mostly no, then most veterinarians, most people who love their pets, and most animal advocates and ethicists would say yes, um, euthanasia is not only permitted, but actually required. Um, and so the important question here is not about 
if, it's about when, okay? Um, the distinctions, as I said before, between voluntary and involuntary are not relevant um, because there's no kind of legally binding um, explicit consent that can be given. People sometimes say, you know, your animal will tell you, right? People tell you your dog will let you know when he's ready to go. People talk about consent or will in that sense, but there's no, no sense in which we could talk about a um, legally binding declaration. Um, and there's also, and this I think is really interesting, no debate about active versus passive. Um, and there's why Hugh LaFollette, who's an American ethicist, says, no one buys this distinction between killing and letting die when deciding the fate of non-human animals. We think it is not just permissible to euthanize an animal in pain. We think it would be grossly inhumane to allow an animal to die slowly and painfully, to let nature take its course. Um, and he points out um, something that he says is very odd and I think is very interesting. Um, Most people believe we should treat humans better than we treat non-human animals. Yet here it seems we're morally permitted to treat dying animals but not dying humans humanely. And this goes back to the point that I started with, that um, editorial. I'm sure you know most of you have heard similar sentiments. I just wish we could be so compassionate with people. Um, and so I think that there's some really important philosophical questions here. Why is it that we have, um, and I'm quoting Jessica Pierce, who's a, about the only ethicist who's really addressed this um, that I can find. Why is it that we have such a revulsion against <coughs> euthanasia for human beings Yet when it comes to animals, this good death comes to feel almost obligatory. If it is such an act of compassion, why shouldn't we be, shouldn't we be more willing to provide this assistance for our beloved human companions as well? And so what you get in these quotes is a sense that it's paradoxical that we can provide this compassionate assistance or what, um, there's a book on uh, called Your Dog's Golden Years, said, calls it the gift of euthanasia. Um, why can we? we provide this gift to our pets, but not to humans. And what I want to suggest is it's because we value human life so much more. Um, so now we get to the second kind of human, of non-human euthanasia. Um, and this is the killing of healthy uh, individuals in uh, animal shelters due to lack of resources, not because they're sick or in, um, in pain or um, very old. And this is um, the way th Three to five million animals uh, die in the United States alone every year. Um, and this is um, something that's interesting here, this, the way that um, recent changes, I think, have shaped this debate or the possibility of a debate. Because this number is massive, but it's actually maybe uh, a third, um, third to half of what the number was a couple of decades ago. And I think the fact that the numbers have gone down so much has made it possible for people to debate the ethics of this. Before, I think, um, there was no light at the end of the tunnel and we couldn't even think about this. Um, and I think this is something I wanna emphasize that the debate here about ethics follows upon structural changes. And um, this, to me, really underlines the way that pragmatic considerations dominate the way we think about non-human lives in a way they don't dominate the ways we think about human life most of the time. Um, that said, animal ethicists have not talked very much about euthanasia. I think it's just taken for granted that it is um, not problematic. Um, except for, in the, in, and there's a little bit of discussion about shelter euthanasia, but not much. Um, Tom Reagan, um, of course, the first person you go to when you think about um, animal ethics, says um, that true euthanasia um, has three conditions. Individual has to be killed in the least painful way possible. The one who does the killing has to believe that it's in the interest of the one killed. And the one who kills must be motivated by concern for the other's good. And he does not think shelter killing meets this, um, these criteria most of the time. And he says, to call them euthanasia is to wrap plain killing in a false verbal cover. Um, and Jessica Pierce, who uh, I mentioned before, um, also says um, euthanasia most of the time is not an appropriate term. Um, to, kill human, to kill these healthy individuals serves human purposes and is not in the best interests of the animals themselves. So talk like that makes some um, animal welfare advocates, uh, at least in the United States, really angry. Um, they think that as long as there are not enough good homes, it's irresponsible for um, people to, um, to call euthanasia killing. They think it is the most compassionate response to overpopulation. Um, as they see it, um, 
they, um, they say that it, it is in fact in the best interest of the animal because the fate that they meet, that they uh, face otherwise is hoarders, abuse, uh, death in the streets. Um, and this is an interesting debate, but not, um, not one that's really relevant here. Um, what I'm interested in is um, comparing these two, and um, I began thinking that what I had was a pretty plausible parallel between pet euthanasia and human euthanasia. Um, and then um, as I began thinking about this a little bit more and reading and, and really trying to do my comparison, I, um, I realized the comparison was not as plausible as I had initially thought. Um, and, um, and that is, I think, s centers on the question of if, which is the question for human euthanasia, um, and for all kinds of animals, it's a question of when. Um, and I turned out, um, you know, in the end, I, I concluded that um, pet euthanasia was not as close to human euthanasia as I had thought, and that, in fact, pet euthanasia and shelter euthanasia were a little closer. Um, and so that's... Um, where I'm gonna get to the uh, themes of the conference that um, I wanted to address more specifically. Um, and um, that is the, the species difference, and in particular, the um, question of whether we can escape our biology, uh, which I think is a really interesting and very problematic question. Um, and the difference, um, whether the difference between humans and other species is one of degree or of kind. So I'm, I'm gonna try and um, think about those um, for a few minutes here. Um, so biology, you know, what is biology? I, I decided I was gonna define it three different ways. Um, bodily life, the naturalness of our existence and our evolutionary origins. And so can we escape biology in any of these three ways? And how does euthanasia help us think about this possibility of escape? So, in regards to the first meaning, um, can we escape the limitations of our bodily, physical, uh, biological existence? Euthanasia is about control over our biological fate. Um, we can postpone it. We can control the circumstances. Um, we can um, postpone death in, in many situations that we couldn't in the past. Um, so I think uh, euthanasia in some ways shows us that we, we can escape some of this, but in the end, it is about the one bodily reality um, that none of us can escape. Um, a second meaning of biology involves the question of whether we have somehow transcended um, naturalness and escaped to a purely cultural or social or technological realm. Um, I, I think that the scientific consensus is that we are always a product of both nurture and nature and um, biology and culture in interaction. Um, and we don't need to choose between these and we cannot escape either. Um, and, I, and that's why I think it's problematic to, to even ask about escaping biology. Even suggesting that it's possible opens the door, I think, to some misguided ways of thinking about who we are and how we are related to our, our, um, our physical existence to other um, forms of life um, and to other species. And it raises the specter of a purely cultural life for humans, in which, which is radically different from the biologically determined life of um, lives of all other species. Um, and the debates about euthanasia can reinforce this sense of otherness, I think, because they assume and underline the uniqueness of human death and therefore of human life. Um, and this brings us to the question of um, evolution and, and our friend Darwin here. Um, the idea of escaping biology in this sense suggests humans are somehow not, or not just, to use that, that little word, um, the result of millions of years of natural selection. Um, and there are, of course, theistic versions and, and secular social constructionist versions, um, both of which say humans are not um, primarily or um, at all or exclusively the, the products of biological evolution. Um, and again, I think that this is a way to distinguish us from the presumed biological determinism um, that, um, from which other creatures cannot escape. And um, I'm not sure um, how euthanasia helps us think about that other than in, in the way I just mentioned in that um, we, uh, it does reinforce our sense of otherness, or reinforce our sense of somehow escaping this biological reality, um, whether it's um, our physical bodies or our evolutionary pasts. Um, and that kind of leads us to the question of um, degree or kind. 
And um, euthanasia is, I think, an interesting way to put species in the front um, as a question rather than just a background. And that's what I'd like to do uh, here in this um, last, last bit. Um, Peter Singer has a, a good question. He says, what in the end is so special about the fact that a life is human? That's the question when we compare euthanasia across species, that's our question. What is so special about the fact that this life is human? Um, and there are many smart people, uh, including many in this room, who have answers to this question. Um, and I, I, won't, I don't want to uh, address those, but I, I want to point out that um, often the notion of human specialness is a starting point, and I think that's really true in the debate about euthanasia. Rather than the end of, a, of an argument or the end of a conversation, it's the starting point, and I guess that's um, what I want to sort of problematize a bit here um, through this lens of uh, bioethics and euthanasia. Um, the conversations about um, going on at this conference and that have gone on in animal ethics and other fields for, for decades pointed out that we tend to value what we're good at. Um, we look, we know we're special, and so what we do is look for traits that define us and um, the contests that we can win, and then we say those are the important contests. Um, and um, one of the things that's changed is that over time, um, the specialness of human of uh, human existence has become universal. It's not just the province of certain humans, and so the discussions about rationality, language, reason, um, now um, sort of undergird a, a broad universal humanistic vision um, that I think is very important and very powerful ideal. Um, and I think that's what makes euthanasia such a fruitful topic. Um, because we, um, it, it pushes us to look behind notion of universal human rights and dignity um, and ask some difficult questions about what makes a particular life valuable to the one who is living it. Um, is human dignity best served by choosing death or by hanging on as long as possible? Um, and I think we could put these, um, and people have put these, um, these questions together with some really interesting, um, interesting uh, debates. Um, but I think the point I want to make is underlying all these different debates is um, an a respect for the dignity and the value of human life. Um, and when we highlight the, um, this, the comparison about different kinds of euthanasia um, looks different. Um, on the first glance, and where I started when I was sort of thinking about this, is the idea that pet euthanasia parallels human euthanasia, and thus that it is radically different from other kinds of killing of animals. Um, and there's um, one uh, legal theorist, actually, who says, the humane killing of pets represents the exception that proves the rule. Pets are honorary family members who are officially exempt from the casually vicious treatment reserved for the remainder of animal kind. That's the kind of quote that I thought I would sort of end up with, right? That, that pet euthanasia would be the exception that proves the rule, as she says. That it's radically different from other ways that we kill animals. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that wasn't exactly where I was going. Um, pet euthanasia is certainly not casually vicious, as she says. But I do think it rests on the same kind of human exceptionalism that does justify more brutal kinds of killing. Um, because what ties these all together is the assumption that non-human life is negotiable. You know, that human life just isn't. Um, and um, this, is, this is why we can talk about when rather than if with um, non-human animals. The end of a human life is a momentous and very terrifying event, and it demands very stringent, rigorous, and hard reflection and justification to end a human life. And the end of an animal's life might be sad, but it is mundane enough that we can calculate, we can weigh costs and benefits about quality of life, in the case of pet euthanasia, or about uh, resources and costs and benefits. Um, and this is true for pets that we love very much, as well as for homeless animals in shelters, and also for um, animals in um, feedlots, and rats in the attic, and um, all kinds of other animals. Um, and I think this is where we, um, we start to draw the lines in our comparison differently, uh, because the bottom line is that it is not um, very hard to justify killing animals, but it is very hard to justify killing people. <laughs> 
Um, and there's only one way in which ethicists, right, my, you know, my tribe of ethicists, seriously discuss uh, whether or not it can be ethical to kill people. Um, so I sort of got myself to this point. So wow, when do we ever justify killing persons? Um, and so I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was at uh, the University of Chicago, actually my alma mater, and I was giving a talk. And I mentioned, sort of as an aside really, um, that just war, war theory says it's okay to kill people sometimes on purpose. And was really an aside, I was not trying to make any point other than a little short definition. And uh, it ended up being by far the most controversial thing I said. Um, took up all the question and answer period afterwards. Um, because there was an ethicist who said, um, no, just war theory did not justify killing people on purpose, and that I was misreading it, and I was not aware of the current state of the debate, and basically completely wrong about the whole thing. Um, so he um, came from this, what's called a convergence approach to just war theory. If any of you are ethicists, you may be familiar with this. It says there is uh, basically pacifism and just war theory are essentially the same thing. They both begin with a prima facie argument against killing, against violence, and the only difference, and it's really a very minor technical point, is that sometimes just war theory says you can, um, you can kill people on purpose if you meet all the correct conditions. So, in other words, I said, sometimes it's okay to kill people on purpose. And uh, that went over really well. But I do think that I was right, um, that that is the difference, that sometimes it's okay to kill people on purpose, according to just war theory. And, and pacifism says, no, that actually is a rule that is not a prima facie rule, it's an absolute rule. You really can't overrule that. And um, the interesting thing, there's a couple of interesting things that I think are relevant to this discussion. One is that, boy, they got really up about a point that was just, I was just trying to sort of define it. I wasn't trying to make any moral claims about just where theory is bad or good. But when you say something permits killing people on purpose, we know killing people on purpose is a bad thing. So if you say your moral theory actually permits killing people on purpose, people take it as an attack, right? And they think that you're attacking them. I was just trying to clarify that I think this is what the position says. I, st I still think it is what it says. Um, the other thing is that just war theory is the only place in which we as ethicists have this conversation about, well, so when would it actually be okay to kill a person on purpose? Okay. Um, and um, I think that this is relevant to this discussion of um, shelter euthanasia and pet euthanasia and human euthanasia because um, just war theory is the only place where we calculate will the benefits outweigh the costs of killing a person? Where we as ethicists, I'm not talking about politicians, etc., or you know, criminals, but we as ethicists actually seriously talk about is it, just a, is it, is it permitted to kill, um, to end some valuable lives because it will bring a greater good. Okay, and so here's the logic, killing is ethical because it is necessary, right? That is the logic of just war theory. So the interesting thing is how did killing get on the table? We don't ever in any other context talk about that for humans. In bioethics it is never, um, never discussed. Something happens to bring the possibility of taking lives into the conversation that ethicists are having. And then, Putting that on the table means we have this conversation about the costs and the benefits and, and calculating, well, how do we limit this and who's actually killable and who's not. Um, but if it weren't on the table, we wouldn't weigh its costs and benefits. We don't talk about the cost of um, taking care of, uh, you know, children in orphanages or, um, you know, people in hospitals or in mental institutions or in prisons. It's never on the table. It would be way cheaper and serve the greater good. We could do so many other things with that, with those resources. We never talk about that. Um, so I think that there's an interesting circularity. And, and what I'm interested in here is not just in um, criticizing just war theory, um, but in asking sort of what puts this on the table in war where it's not on the table in any other place. And I think that there's something that happens in a war with the, a dehumanization, and that's an important word, right? A dehumanization and also a distance and a, and a devaluation, a de-individualization of those who are to be killed. Um, that makes that um, okay. Um, 
When we talk about human euthanasia and assisted suicide, um, killing is only permitted because it is what the person would want for herself it is, or himself. It is in the interests of the person. Um, it has to be a good for the person dying. It can't be good for something else. And again, this is the slippery slope argument is you might start euthanizing people because it serves a greater good. That's the, the problem because, you know, instead of doing open heart surgery on this person, we could instead vaccinate seven million children. And so maybe we ought to do that. And, and that's where um, they don't want the debate to go. Um, and I think that that's okay um, not to go there. Um, but um, in just war theory, we do make it possible. Um, to, to weigh those costs and benefits. Um, and this is really, I think, the only, only situation that ethicists do that. And you know, I tried to think, well, so what else? Where else do we debate the ethics of killing? Well, there's capital punishment, which you know, in my country is a debate. Um, and however, there the person killed has placed himself outside the, the circle of personhood, as it, as it were, right? So it's a different kind of debate. It's not about the killing of innocents. And in just war theory, you have non-combatant immunity, which supposedly says who is supposed to be um, killable. But in reality, just war theorists always acknowledge that civilians will be killed, right? And um, so, so I don't think non-combatant immunity is the same as um, the, uh, the criminal conviction that's necessary in capital punishment. I, I, th I think it's an interesting question, but I, th I, th I think it's different. And then also abortion, of course, is the other um, situation. And then again, it's not a debate about can we kill this person, it's a debate about is this a person, right? That is the, the moral debate most of the time. Um, so I think those are not exact um, persons, uh, exact uh, parallels. Um, anyway, um, my point for this comparison is again, that um, the fact of just war theory, and, and maybe of these other cases, is that we hardly ever consider the lives of humans negotiable in a way in which, um, or possible for the greater good, even though we acknowledge it's a harm to the person dying. We acknowledge it's not for their good, but we say it's worth it for the greater good, right? Um, and that phrase, for the greater good, is of course a, a buzzword that, um, as ethicists and, and, and um, other kinds of people, we find very problematic, right? Um, it's, you're supposed to do something for the person's good. So with animals, of course, we can kill them for the greater good, and that's the interesting question about shelter euthanasia, is that debate about whether or not it's in the animal's interest. Um, and again, the debate about shelter euthanasia is not about, and not between people who think that those animals don't matter. There are plenty of people, of course, who think that those animals don't matter at all, but they're not involved in that debate, really. The debate is between people who, who are trying to figure out what's best for them, I think. Um, so I'd like to, to leave time with, uh, for questions, so I'm just going to wind up uh, with a, a few um, thoughts here. Um, I thought, again, I would find different kinds of parallels and different kinds of distinctions um, that I did, um, than I did. And, and what I ended up with was that the species difference here is very much one of kind and not of degree. Um, that the apparent parallels between pet euthanasia and human euthanasia, when we inject species as an important variable, those apparent parallels turn out to, to actually be quite different. Um, and when we also, um, in this same light, I think the apparent differences between pet euthanasia and sheltering euthanasia become, um, become less, less clearly different. Um, because of the question of what lives are contingent and what are negotiable and what are absolute. Um, and that was the reason that I, uh, I went into my little um, discourses about um, just war. And I think there's a lot more to be said. I'm sure you guys have um, some questions. But I want to make one more um, minor point, um, which is that our thinking about all these issues is shaped by context and culture and habit as much as it is by moral argumentation. Um, and our idea that it's almost always wrong to kill people, usually acceptable to kill animals, and sometimes permissible to go to war, are not backed only by moral arguments that are rigorous and well justified, but also by a sense of what is realistic or intuitively correct, um, which are very culturally conditioned and historically specific. 
right? The claim to realism, what is realistic, what is utopian, what is naive, um, are very, very culturally conditioned terms. Um, and people throw those around as though um, everyone knows what's, what's realistic. And, and this is very central to the debate about um, just in just war theory um, and the debate between pacifists and, and just war theorists, and also, I think, to debates about shelter euthanasia, right? Um, and um, realism does not enter into debates about human euthanasia. It's absolutely off the table in discussions of, uh, is it really realistic to perform open heart surgery on this person? It doesn't, um, that just doesn't come into the debates that ethicists have. Um, and so, you know, I always tell students that when you see anything, a word like intuition or common sense or realism, or realistic in uh, anything, it is a red flag that tells you that person does not have a good argument or at least hasn't, hasn't really worked it out. Um, and I think the way the argument works out here, um, the way any argument works out depends on where you start. And um, this gets us back to the question of species. Um, do we begin with species as a question and the species difference as a question or as a starting point? Is it a background where we already all know what we think and what's important or do we pose it as a question? Okay, and um, I think if we pose species as a question rather than as a starting point, um, we, we ask different questions. We don't perhaps have the same kind of, oh, I'm way back. Uh, that, look, that's a formerly adoptable pit bull. Um, in conclusion, um, I'm not used to doing PowerPoint, so I uh, forgot to move myself forward. Um, I think it's OK sometimes for a lived ethic to be inconsistent. And um, I like to quote Walt Whitman, uh, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. It's very handy. Yeah. It comes in very handy, that quote, especially when you're from a bunch of, in front of students, a bunch of students who uh, point out that you said something completely different yesterday. Um, so I am large. I contain multitudes. You all contain multitudes. Um, that's good. Um, but as an ethicist, I think we can't just you know, always resort to complexity or uh, diversity or the inevitability of some contradictions or intuition or common sense. Um, and that is uh, really a huge risk when we talk about species. We assume that something is different about humans and so something has to be different about the way we talk about human lives um, and non-human lives. And um, I don't have any conclusion. I really don't have um, any particularly strong feelings about um, human euthanasia. I don't know really what I think about it. Um, I kind of know what I think about non-human euthanasia. Um, I kind of know what I think about just war theory. But um, I think my point here and sort of the value for me of this exercise of doing the comparison is th that species is, is more important than anything else. It's more important than quality of life. It's more important than the other things we think we're debating. What we think, um, what we think maybe we're arguing about um, is not really the case. And I think if we forefront that and say, yes, we really are um, talking about species and we're assuming certain things about the difference that species makes, we might have different conversations and they might be really very, um, very interesting ones. And also, uh, I have a feeling very problematic ones. Um, so with that, why don't we, um, let Merrick uh, moderate some questions and I, ah, oh, good, I did, and that. So if they if they throw if they throw tomatoes, I'm standing behind you. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's going to get behind me for the tomato throwing. That's not. Fantastic timing. We've got uh, just under half an hour questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. We've got one up there and then one down. I'd like to ask you a question that sounds uh, a bit uh, frivolous, but it's not. Uh, and that is, uh, do we euthanize pets because they aren't religious? That's really interesting. I think you're getting maybe the question of a soul. Yeah, and I, well, yeah. I kind of, and I'd like to unpack a little bit this way. Um, we often use, in, uh, you know, when you're talking medical ethics, we, we talk about uh, things like sanctity of life. And, you know, uh, William May talks about the summum malum and the summum bonum. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about, you know, is it, is it pain, is it suffering, is it, uh, thank you, is it, uh, or is it life itself? And, and we come to these issues with uh, freighted language. So we have the sanctity of life. So if you're looking at something like, um, my dog Charlie. Um, if I euthanize my dog Charlie, I will be sad 
but we don't think of media as being sinful. Exactly. And so um, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in, and that, that comes back to the species difference again, and so I'm, I'm curious about that in terms of isn't uh, religiosity uh, maybe something that is profoundly, uh, profoundly shapes uh, this in, in certain ways, even in the language we use about you know, sanctity of life, yeah. sinfulness, and, and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and, and can you kind of unpack it that way? I think you've just done a great job of unpacking it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's, you know, I sort of mentioned it, but I didn't dwell on it. The question of the sacredness of human life is very much um, because of the idea that there's something special about the way in which humans were created. And whether it's an immortal soul or, or some other way that you want to describe that, it's, um, it just makes taking a human life a radically different, yeah, you might be sad, it might be tragic, you might feel really, really bad uh, for a long time, and at the same time, oh, it's the only thing I could do, but it's, you know, was it the right thing, was it too soon, was it too late, all those, there are real moral debates that go on about that, um, but, um, yeah, it doesn't have that religious weight, I think you, you pinpointed something really important. You said you were not committed to a view on um, human euthanasia, but I'd like to ask if, if you do have a view on this idea of letting nature take its course. Because, um, I mean, is this nature as opposed to dying by way of some cultural technological process? And if so, then in what respect is euthanasia any less natural than any other physical process? Mm -hmm. In what respect is knowingly letting something happen any less one's responsibility than making something happen? Um, and well, I'm being you know, asking rhetorical questions here. Um, if you accept them, then what possible purpose can this appeal to letting nature take its course serve? Mm -hmm. um, I think on that, actually, I would agree with um, with with um, Rachel's and and Beauchamp, the philosophers I quoted earlier, that the crucial issue is deciding that death is a good for the person, and if that decision, if that person has made the decision, and it's not a case of you're in terrible pain for now, but we know that it's going to be better, right? If it's not a case where the person thinks they want to die, but physicians can say, no, 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 we know, we know that it's going to get better, right? So if the person believes that death is a good and the physicians and other people say, yeah, it's not gonna get any better, you, you are right. Uh, it, this really is all that there's left. If the decision is made then that death is a good or would be a good for that person, I think that's the crucial discussion. Um, and I agree that, um, frankly, um, I would not want myself or someone I loved, or, or really any, anyone, to um, die from starvation or dehydration slowly. I think that um, an overdose of morphine would be, uh, you know, so, so on that I agree. And I think that the, that's why I quoted the, the philosophers, and there's not that many of them really. I mean, this distinction between passive and active is very taken for granted in a lot of the literature in bioethics. Um, and I, I, I like the fact that these guys are problematizing that, um, that that uh, may not be the really important hard and fast line to draw. And I think, um, I think it was Rachel's, one of them says, if you've decided that death is a good, then go ahead and give the morphine. Yeah. Um, th thank you for the way you set out the issues and also for leaving it open at the end. I thought it was very courteous of you um, for, for discussion. And I particularly like the honorary, fam the honorary family members bit. I've got to think more about that. So thank you for that. Um, but uh, I'd like to just, I had a slight complaint about the way you set up the, the, the theistic perspective on euthanasia, because it makes it sound as if um, it's all about divine voluntarism. If God values human life, um, he gives, he takes away, it's just that's just his decision, inscrutable mm -hmm. will. But there's, there's actually a context within, which is, within which this is framed, which is rather different which is that the story of the human life is a, is a story you don't know it until it's completed. Mm -hmm. And a Christian and an atheist would agree that that pattern is set forever. So you know, once, you, once the life is over, that's it um, forever. The difference, of course, comes to the Christian perspective is that that's the pattern of a new kind of life mm -hmm. forever. And so that's the context within which people are very wary about cutting it short because a lot of exciting things can happen from a supernatural perspective in the last few minutes and hours of life. People may not share that, that perspective, but that is in fact the context within which the argument mm -hmm. is framed. Thank you. That's a great point, and you know, it actually is something I, um, there are so many things I didn't put in, right, because I was trying not to 
you know, talk for hours. But um, I, read, uh, I read a bunch of different religious, um, you know, kind of both official statements and also ethicists within different traditions working on this. And I found really interesting um, some the Mennonite discussions, which said um, something not exactly what you're saying, but I think another important point from a religious perspective, which is that euthanasia can be a way of distancing ourselves from suffering we cannot bear. And instead that the, the call, you know, they say for the Mennonite, what we should do is share in that suffering rather than try and end it prematurely or, or make it go away, basically, um, and saying that from the Christian perspective, their idea was we should share in that. So I, th I think that there is a, a very profound and important um, discussion. And as I say, that's part of why I'm not really sure how I feel about human euthanasia. But at the same time, I think if someone decides for euthanasia, the letting die slowly is not necessarily better than um, the quick and painless death, but what I'm not sure about is the, the, the if question, and I think, um, think that there are a lot of important, um, you know, and I'm in general really skeptical about slippery slope arguments, but I think there is a sense of, and there's some, some discussion about will people feel that they need to um, tell their relatives, yes, I'm, I'm ready, sooner than they might be because of, you know, various issues of resources and all. So that's a, that's a really good point. It just, uh, it, I find it interesting that we are, as humans, talking about an uh, uh, animal and euthanasia. So I was just wondering if there's anything equivalent in animal behavior to euthanasia, or if it's a specifically human thing to to do I asked Barbara. <laughs> um, you know, I thought about that, and um, you know, sometimes um, you know, some social animals will take care of a of a sick or wounded companion for a really long time until they die. They will bring them food. They will care for them. They will stay close. Sometimes they will abandon and move on. You know, the group moves on, and you know, we're sorry, but. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of variety in the ways, even within a particular species maybe, um, individuals may deal with a very uh, sick or dying individual um, in terms of act, you know, who, in, in terms of letting die. Do we stay with you and, uh, you know, sort of um, help keep you alive as long as we can by bringing you food, et cetera, or do we just sort of, you know, send you out on your ice flow, uh, you know, and, um, you're on your own, um, and obviously human uh, populations have, have done that too. Um, in terms of the sort of letting die, um, in terms of actively killing because someone's in pain, I've never heard of or read anything in the literature on animal behavior that would suggest that, but I mean, so really, I thought about that, and I, I, you know, I've never come across it. I haven't actively looked for that, but I've never encountered it in my reading. Really interesting question. You started with the ideas about human exceptionalism and the absolute value of human life, which, which uh, started me thinking about the idea that when we talk about human exceptionalism, we often define what is human by exceptional humans in such a way that we make what is exceptional normative, right? So then I started thinking what that means when we talk about the absolute value of human life. Do we not sometimes protect the absolute value of exceptional humans, but neglect the value of human life for others? So I wondered if you know of any literature about um, disproportionate kinds of decisions about euthanasia active, passive, voluntary, involuntary, non-voluntary, when it comes to the humans who are not exceptional. You know, for example, those uh, in extreme poverty, those with disabilities, those um, who don't have the right citizenship for the country where I live. You, um, is there any literature about that? In which case, there may be a kind of uh, or a different category even of uh, euthanasia. I, I think even of heart transplant patients who automatically are excluded based not on physical mm -hmm. criteria sometimes, but by age itself. Yeah. Um, I think here we would get to this question of um, letting die. It's a, I mean, we let people die all the time. 
right? Uh, so many ways. You know, Peter Singer would say, "Are you giving, you know, half your income to to you know foreign aid?" Uh, you know, and it depends on questions that ethicists would really differ on. Who are we accountable to? Who are we responsible for? How far away are the people, um, you know, for whom we are responsible? Um, am I letting die uh, someone who's starving to death, you know, 10,000 miles away right now, or someone who's starving to death, you know, in, in close to home? Am I letting that person die that I've never met? Um, most people would say, no, you're not accountable for that. Um, so, um, I think there'd be two, you know, in terms of the discussion about euthanasia, I haven't seen anything on that, and I think the sort of two interesting questions would be, one, that question of accountability, responsibility. You know, in euthanasia, there is a physician who is going to inject or, you know, prescribe, uh, you know, an overdose of morphine or inject it himself or herself, right? So there's that direct accountability and responsibility. There's a personal relationship, which we don't have necessarily for the people we let die far away. Um, and the other question, of course, is it's not euthanasia if it's not painless. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, euthanasia is an interesting way to sort of open up this question of letting die and when is it okay to let die and when do we think we even need to debate it and talk about it? Because you're talking about circumstances in which we do let people die when we could probably do something about it. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's also those interesting questions about abandonment of someone who is in your own group who you can't continue to carry along. And that might be another um, a question. And I, I've read, you know, firsthand accounts and I've, you know, um, also seen lots of discussion of secondhand accounts of people who, um, you know, so in, in the case that, that I've, you know, where I've, I've heard firsthand accounts of in, um, you know, in Central America in, in um, wars, in El Salvador, for example, groups of people behind a, um, you know, fleeing an ar enemy army who is going to kill them as civilians, and they are hiding someplace where they can be heard, and there is a baby who, who is crying. And um, the parents there have been parents, and I've talked to them, who have suffocated their own babies to save the larger group. So that's, is that euthanasia? It's not for the good of the baby, except that it was because the baby would have been one of those, you know, civilians, and it was for the good of the other hundred. And so I think that would be an interesting kind of death to debate the morality of it. Um, and it certainly happens more than once, and I'm sure it happens in many different settings where, um, you know, um, and that's that's an active kind of killing. Could, you know, so I think that, that, you know, sort of once you open this up about like when is human life negotiable, when can we calculate the greater good, then we get out of the realm of bioethics because they do not calculate the greater good. Bioethics will not ever calculate. They won't ever say, forget the, the heart transplant, the guy's 70, I know he's rich, I know his wife really loves him, I know he's got good insurance, but forget the heart transplant because we'd really rather just go vaccinate all those kids. That never, ever happens in bioethics. It's just not a debate about the greater good. And I think that that's, um, you know, we can, you know, if we start asking this question, we get into really interesting ones, but we're past kind of euthanasia, per se. And you mentioned that death row is me as a, a kind of not quite human anymore in terms of the... Yeah, morally, we right. sort of decide that they're not in the circle anymore. They have placed themselves outside that circle, so that's why it's not killing a person. For those who, you know, it's certainly not something that, you know, n there's certainly tons of ethical debates that don't take that perspective, yeah. So there are a couple of people around here and then we'll go to... Um, we, we've been uh, talking uh, about um, uh, humans and about companion animals, and in both cases the, 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 there's been at least a desire to minimize pain but we regard companion animals differently from, for example, the millions of animals killed in slaughterhouses who, uh, who seem to be regarded outside the realm. We know that in many cases they are killed without uh, that sort of care. They're killed, they're, 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 they're terrified, all sorts of other things, and we close our eyes to them. And uh, it, it seems to me that, that we can, that, that we are closing our eyes to a whole area of um, uh, where morality should be uh, should be brought to bear. I mean, this th this seems to me to be um, uh, and to be you know, 
ex an extremely important extension if we, we, we shouldn't just be thinking about dogs and cats, but about everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that was kind of how I, I got into thinking about companion animal euthanasia because, you know, as that person I quoted said, they, they seem to be the exception that proves the rule. The one time when we really give them treatment like we would give to a human, right, is with pets. Um, and even in shelters, dogs and cats are treated differently. And, uh, you know, I don't know about um, the UK, but in the United States, there are very different laws for animal cruelty. You can do things to a cow or a chicken or a pig that you could be prosecuted, you know, felony animal cruelty for doing that to a dog or cat. Um, so there are some really important differences. On the other hand, there are also laws, and you know, I've, I've got all students here in the agriculture school, and we debate this, right? And they, they say, no, 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 there's, you know, the, 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 there's no pain, there's no stress, there's you know, Temple Grandin, blah, 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 stun guns, etc. cetera. Um, so there is a debate, and there's some sense that, that uh, among people involved in that, that, you know, no, we really are minim that there's an effort to, to, to claim at least that they are minimizing suffering and that the mode of death is painless and that the you know minutes leading up to it are not full of stress and fear. Um, I'm not sure, frankly, you know, having spent a lot of time in animal shelters, I, I don't know, to a slaughterhouse in your average public animal shelter, there's not much to choose from in terms of pure terror, you know, and discomfort. Um, you know, difference in the method of killing, uh, yeah, but in terms of the absolute terror and, and you know, stress in those settings, at least in American public um, animal shelters, you know, is not. Um, so there's a different rhetoric, but I think, um, you know, again, that's why sort of companion animal euthanasia is a, an interesting way to talk about. We think that pets are so different, but then it turns out some of those differences maybe aren't as great as we thought, I think. But uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's, the, uh, it's an obvious and important question, yeah. So, if you could go to the gentleman with the glasses. Gentleman with the glasses, that doesn't narrow it down very much. <laughs> <laughs> that last question was exactly what I was going to ask, but I just wanted to add an additional observation, which was that I, I heard recently that the biomass of all of the domesticated animals that we raise for food now exceeds the biomass of all of the wild animals on Earth. Hmm. So if that isn't a human difference or exceptionalism, I don't know what is. We've essentially put the whole natural world to mm -hmm. observe us. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you not address this at all? Is, is it simply so In massive this? a problem that... No. Um, I actually just wrote a book about animals and environmental ethics where I talk a lot about the difference about domestication and wild and that difference between wild and domestic and how it has mattered in environmental ethics. So yeah, it's a very important issue. Um, obviously we don't euthanize wild animals other than say, um, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure there's times when people say hunters want, think that they are killing painlessly an, an animal that they have shot and wounded. But in general, you know, euthanasia, sort of deliberate mercy killing for the good of the individual is not relevant for, for wild animals in the wild. Uh, you know, I'm sure in zoos it's an issue, but Thank you very much for your talk. First, a declaration of interest. I was a doctor for 37 years, and there were many patients who suffered abominably at the end of their lives, and I felt I let them down desperately by not being able to meet their needs at this time of greatest need, which is why, second declaration of interest, I was chair of healthcare professionals for assisted dying for three years. And I think it's very important to clarify certain things. First of all, euthanasia is not the same as assisted dying. The important thing is with uh, assisted dying, two things are different. One is the person is terminally ill, and secondly, that the last act is carried out by the patient. So I think that's very important, two very important constraints. In terms of the experience of assisted dying, in the States you have three states that have actually implemented assisted dying laws. The first is Oregon, which for nearly 20 years now has had assisted dying, and all the anxieties that were raised in relation to assisted dying have not materialized. For example, to pick up a question that the lady asked earlier on, the profile of people who avail themselves of assisted dying is actually not of the vulnerable, not of the poverty-stricken, and not of the very old. 
it's typically feisty people who used to get in their own way. Secondly, of those who discuss assisted dying with their physicians, for every 50, only one proceeds to take the medication. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, the slippery stoke has stubbornly refused to be slippery. There has been no change in the num significant change in the numbers or indeed the indications for assisted dying. And so, I, for me, it is an absolute no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And in particularly in a country like yours, where you actually have euthanasia for people who don't want to die. You actually have the most barbaric, unbelievable thing called the death penalty. And the idea that people in Texas can be desperately opposed to assisted dying for people who want to die, and totally relaxed for killing young people, or indeed people at any age, to me seems to be about as morally incoherent as you could possibly imagine. The final point is that when it comes to the difference between humans and uh, pets, really to pick up what's been said, I can't remember when I last felt inclined to eat a patient. Or a dog or a cat, probably. <coughs> well, well, people eat dogs and cats, you know, but I mean, I don't personally. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thanks for your talk. I think this is a very interesting and important uh, subject. And to pick up on what was said about uh, farmed and research animals, there are, is, it, it, I don't know if it fundamentally changes the thesis that you were building towards, and it may well not, but there are, in the AVMA standards for farm animal euthanasia, research animal euthanasia, mm -hmm. and farm animal euthanasia is distinct from farm animal slaughter. Farmers often don't want to do it because you can't eat an animal that's been euthanized. Right. It's pumped full of chemicals. Um, but in addition to the species difference between human and animals, the species difference between animals and other animals Rats and mice used in research that are sort of doubly othered, as Linda mm -hmm. Burke has put it, right. um, is uh, to look at that in some more detail, I, I, it may complicate the picture rather than just looking at pets and companion mm -hmm. animals. I don't know precisely how. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, and that's, again, you know, sort of going further down, you know, than I had room for. Um, I do actually have a footnote on. Uh, rats and mice uh, on research animals, um, which, uh, you know, basically said this is the third category kind way in which euthanasia is used in the literature, and I don't consider it euthanasia because it's clearly not for the good of the animal. It's an animal that's being killed at the end, uh, you know, in other words, it's different from, so strictly speaking, if I'm going to define euthanasia fairly narrowly, that it has to be a good for the individual dying. Well, the death yeah. is, is a good for the animal if the animal is being used in terrible ways to right. study, say, arthritis or yeah, something that has it's a, it's a, Yeah, yeah, I, I guess. And, you know, I know with farm animal euthanasia, an animal that's very ill, you know, just like your pet cat can get very ill, you know, uh, uh, you know pig in a, um, you know, in a feedlot can get very ill. And so euthanasia does arise in those cases, yeah. You have five minutes left. No tomatoes, come, come on. No? Okay, so I guess we've finished here. Uh, hope you join me in thanking um, yeah. Anna Peterson for an incredibly interesting talk and discussion.